Good evening and welcome to this edition of History in Highballs as part of the North Carolina Museum of History's History at Home Initiative. We're so glad that you're joining us for this evening's program, History in Highballs, How North Carolina Became the Moonshine Capital of the World with Dr. Daniel S. Pierce, author and professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education over at the museum. So whenever you sign up for one of these History in Highballs programs, you and I will virtually get to spend the evening together and listen to some incredible stories about North Carolina places and people and what makes our state so special. Tonight's program is just one of many exciting digital offerings available through our History at Home initiative. So if you'd like to learn more, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at www.ncmuseumofhistory.org. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our North Carolina Museum of History Associates and Foundation for making this evening's program possible. Our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make events like this evening's event happen. If you'd like to learn more about becoming an Associates member, we invite you to head over to their website at www.ncmoha.com. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank those of you who graciously donated funds towards this evening's program. We endeavor to keep our programming free to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping these series going, and we continue to be so humbled by your generous support of the museum and its programming. So thank you so much. If you haven't already used the link in your Eventbrite email to check out the specially themed cocktail for this evening's program, the Candy Apple, with special guest bartender Mark Beavers from Mingle Bars. We invite you to head over to the museum's YouTube channel and do that now. It is moonshine, fantastic, and one of a kind. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program. And then if you have any questions for the speaker, so please type them into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of this evening's program, I will ask the speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it's my honor to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Daniel S. Pierce. Dr. Pierce is the author of six books, most recently, Tar Heel Lightning, How Secret Stills and Fast Cars Made North Carolina the Moonshine Capital of the World. He serves as Interdisciplinary Distinguished Professor of the Mountain South and Resident Professional Hillbilly at the University of North Carolina Asheville, where he teaches course on the South, Appalachia, North Carolina, and the National Park. Okay, Dr. Pierce, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, if you can turn my camera on. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay. And thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that uh, introduction. And uh, it's, it's my privilege. Uh, North Carolina is so fortunate. Uh, to have so many wonderful state institutions, and and we're um, if you know if you've been around the country to other places, we uh, you know the North Carolina Museum of History is one of, if not the finest state museum in the country, and so it's my privilege to be here with you. So um, you know there are, um, as I like to talk about, a number of distinctions that the state of North Carolina has. Uh, in fact, um, I would say the one the one criticism I would have of the North Carolina Museum of History would would be having that uh, uh, the Wright brothers plane on the um, uh, on the uh, uh, logo there. Uh, that's long been a, a, a uh, something that's bugged me uh, in that we have to find uh, uh, honor a couple of guys from Ohio. Uh, as the, the best thing about North Carolina. But North Carolina has so many things that distinguish it, uh, that, um, that uh, are so wonderful uh, about this state. And, you know, things like, you know, there are a lot of things that come to mind, but um, uh, college basketball. I grew up in this state and that's always been something wonderful. Uh, barbecue, I'm a big barbecue fan. Of course, we argue as North Carolinians all the time about uh, the best kind of barbecue, but but we make wonderful barbecue in the state. Bluegrass music is another thing that um, that we talk about. The uh, the Piedmont blues, the the jazz musicians who have come from North Carolina, uh, and again, so many things that we can talk about. Uh, but one of the things that I um, like to talk about is the fact that 
there may be no other enterprise uh, in the state uh, that has distinguished itself more, produced more world-class individuals uh, than Moonshine. And uh, now, uh, if you heard the subtitle uh, of the book, it's how uh, Secret Stills and, and uh, Fast Cars made North Carolina the moonshine capital of the world. Uh, and you may ask, you know, how, you know, how can you say that? And uh, it is something that's very speculative, uh, speculative and, you know, for a number of reasons. One, uh, this is an illegal secret enterprise. And so we don't have records. And of course, one of the challenges of doing research on moonshine in North Carolina is we don't have records. Uh, or if people did keep records, uh, that's not a good thing, you know, because you, you would get caught uh, uh, for sure. Or when you did get caught, that would be in highly incriminating evidence. So that's a challenge. People, um, people talk about it more and admit to their involvement, but for a long time, uh, it was not really socially acceptable. And some people still have that uh, uh, feeling about it. So, you know, how can you say that North Carolina is number one? Well, uh, the big issue, I mean, of course, we have a lot, uh, the, the way that culture, uh, the culture of moonshine has permeated the state in so many ways. And it's one of the fun things that I was able to do research on and write about the movies, the songs, the um, the plays, the poems, the books, uh, y you name it, that involve moonshine in North Carolina. Um, and also, um, but uh, we do have some direct evidence and those are the records of uh, wh what was once called, originally called the alcohol tax unit. Uh, and that's the division of the treasury department uh, which is now alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives, and I think something else uh, as well, but uh, that is tasked with enforcing the federal excise tax on liquor. So we have those records, and we also have state records as well about arrests, uh, bust of stills, uh, this type of thing uh, over the years. And particularly if you look at the ATU records, uh, North Carolina consistently uh, has uh, been in the, uh, the top one or two uh, uh, throughout the history, which is kind of ironic when you think about it because North Carolina has also this, this history as a staunch prohibition state. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, that may seem ironic, but it's, those are connected in many ways because, you know, North Carolina, in North Carolina, part of the reason that moonshine uh, was so important uh, and, and so long lasting as an important industry in the state was because of that prohibition uh, ethic in the state and the prohibition laws in the state. So uh, just to uh, share uh, something real quick here, uh, this is something that uh, someone who came to one of my talks or uh, uh, once sent me and I love it. Uh, and so this is my proposal uh, for the state uh, instead of the Wright brothers that we have a first in moonshine um, license tag. So, um, so those of you who have any influence in the state, you know, might, might propose that. So, but anyway, I love this uh, uh, image and very appreciative of the individual who shared that with me. So, all right, well, um, what I want to talk about tonight are uh, kind of the myth and reality of moonshine in North Carolina. And again, um, moonshine is so important in the state. I, I really uh, argue in the book that, um, you know, alongside those very important North Carolina uh, industries of, of tobacco, of, um, of uh, furniture, and of course, textiles, uh, that moonshine, uh, if you were able to calculate the economic impact of the state uh, would probably rank up there among those, uh, at least in fourth place and, and probably higher. So, but I wanna look at some of the myths and realities of, of moonshine in this state. So I'm gonna start my PowerPoint here and we'll start that. So we can see the the, the cover, I, uh, I love the cover of this book. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who's a Nashville, Tennessee graphic designer who I've 
done a couple of books with on um, national parks uh, uh, did this, designed this. So uh, Joel Anderson. So if you go to the Anderson Design Group website, wonderful, wonderful posters. So uh, now the first uh, myth I want to deal with related to moonshine in the state is that there is a notion people generally associate moonshine with the mountains. And, um, and that's the, um, you know, and, and we think of it as something related to Appalachia, uh, to Western North Carolina. And uh, that's true. Many of the top moonshine counties in North Carolina uh, were in the mountains. I, I, I happen to love this. This is a pretty well-known uh, postcard that was distributed that was done originally in the 1920s, but uh, was around for a long time on the market. Uh, it was done interestingly by a Japanese American uh, photographer by the name of George Massa, who's pretty well known in the Western part of the state. He was very instrumental in the creation of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park for one, uh, for one thing. The other thing that's really interesting that I was able to, to discover in, the, in my research that the man on the left there is an individual some of you may be familiar with by the name of Bascom Lamar Lunsford. He was originally from Madison County, lived, lived in Northern Buncombe County most of his life, was known as the minstrel of the Appalachians. He was a song catcher. Uh, and um, uh, so this was a posed of, of photograph here, but that's pretty much our image of uh, moonshine in, uh, in general. Uh, and moonshine in North Carolina, as it says there, moon, typical moonshine still in the heart of the mountains, we think of as a mountain thing. But one of the things that I wanted to do in the book uh, is to show that it's not, uh, in North Carolina especially, it is not just a mountain thing. Uh, and in fact, uh, moonshine was important in almost every county in the state. And we'll talk actually about Wake County and some of the surrounding counties a little later, but um, uh, some of you may know North Carolina uh, is the home to um, two places that were, uh, that have been characterized at one time or another as the moonshine capital of the world. Uh, one of those is Wilkes County, which we kind of expect a mountain county uh, right on the edge of the foothills. Uh, of course, Wilkes has this huge reputation uh, continuing to date. But the other moonshine capital of the world was in Buffalo City, uh, which is not far uh, from Manio. Uh, it's down in the, um, uh, uh, what's now the uh, uh, Alligator National Wildlife Refuge uh, in the middle of a swamp. And one of the things that uh, I've talked about a lot uh, in doing talks about the book and, and in the book itself is the fact that a swamp is as good as a mountain holler. And, uh, uh, but uh, it's not just in the swamps, it's in the foothills, uh, obviously the mountains, it's in the Piedmont, it's in the piney woods, wherever you can hide, uh, can hide a still, you know, which could include, uh, you know, an underground bunker uh, underneath a barn or something like that. The largest still ever uncovered in North Carolina uh, was in um, uh, the Concord area uh, in an underground bunker. Uh, so again, uh, you know, anywhere you can hide it. Now, uh, you might ask the question, why was that the case? And it has a lot to do with economics uh, and the fact that uh, going way back in North Carolina history from the very beginning when, uh, when Europeans first came uh, to the area, they brought with them long traditions and a culture built around the dis distil distillization of, of, of liquor. And uh, they very quickly adapted to the, to the grain of the realm, to the native grain corn, and um, became very proficient at that. And it was perfectly legal except for a relatively short time in the 1790s when Alexander Hamilton mistakenly pushed through a federal excise tax, which resulted in the Whiskey Rebellion, but it was perfectly legal up until, and so, um, you know, throughout the antebellum period, I mean, it was very much a part of the culture. It was very much a part of the farmers, particularly the middle-class yeoman farmer and poorer farmers. Uh, making liquor was uh, something you did in the off season from from planting and, and tilling and harvesting crops 
<clears throat> and uh, was an important part of their economic life in terms of, it, it was something that dependably yielded cash money. And so these economic conditions were true all over the state. Uh, and so, and, and then after the Civil War, it actually becomes even more important. But during the Civil War in 1862, Congress passed, um, which there was no North Carolina representation in Congress at that time because of the Civil War, uh, but Congress passed the federal excise tax, which has never gone away. Uh, and, uh, and so what made it illegal, a lot of people think it was prohibition. Uh, what made it illegal in North Carolina or, or all over the country was this federal excise tax. You had to pay the excise tax. Now there was still legal distilling in North Carolina, but farmers generally uh, made so little liquor and, and if they paid the excise tax, they would make no, no profit off of their liquor. And so most farmers in the state uh, made the decision early on when the federal government started enforcing that excise tax in the late 1860s, uh, that uh, you either had to decide you're gonna quit making liquor, but again, this is an important part of their economic life. And, and particularly in the post-war conditions, the economy is really bad. Uh, you're either gonna quit making it or you're gonna make it illegally. And so hundreds of thousands of North Carolinians decided that they would make it illegally. Now, prohibition comes along in the, um, locally in the 1890s and then statewide. In 1909, North Carolina, one of the earliest states to go completely dry. Uh, and when that happens, uh, that is an incredible boom to moonshiners because it raised the price of their liquor. It drove the legal manufacturers out of the market and uh, dramatically increase their profits. And particularly when national prohibition comes along, uh, that was an incredible uh, gift to North Carolina moonshiners who are now sending their products all over the country, uh, particularly uh, along the East Coast. Uh, but again, so it's statewide because you have, you know, a, a large class of middling and poor farmers in North Carolina who were dependent on alcohol, on, on distilling alcohol uh, as part of their economic life. So all over the state, it's important. And, and it, it stays that way. And again, some of the more, more prominent and memorable moonshiners come not from the mountains, but from uh, the Piedmont coastal plain and, and from the tidewater. Um, another myth is that Moonshiners look like this. If some of you may be familiar with the gentleman uh, with the beard and the funny hat uh, there, uh, Popcorn Sutton, who was from uh, Haywood County, Maggie Valley area, and became quite the celebrity uh, in the early 2000s. In fact, really was responsible for a major re uh, revival in moonshine in the early 2000s, which we are still in the midst of today. Uh, but we have this, this idea about what a moonshiner looks like, Snuffy Smith there, uh, and then the famous Mountaineer Inn sign in Asheville, uh, uh, which is one of the great icons of this area. But, uh, you know, that's our notion of what a moonshiner is and what a moonshiner looks like. He, he's male, he's a mountaineer, one. We know that's not true uh, necessarily. He wears a funny hat, he's got a long beard, uh, he um, is white uh, and he's male. So that's our image. But one of the things that I really wanted to do with the book was to highlight the fact that that's just not the case in North Carolina or really anywhere where moonshine is going on. And a moonshiner uh, could look like this and a significant number probably did, but they could also look like this. And uh, um, one of the things that, um, it's important, again, is that not only is moonshine in every part of the state, it really is um, uh, the, the people making the, moon, making the moonshine, distributing it, hauling the moonshine, all of this represent practically every demographic group, group in the state. Um, there are uh, significant numbers. One of the untold stories, and I you know, I, uh, I tell the story as best I can. I would, I would, I would love it. Uh, you know, I'm hoping for some enterprising 
graduate student to really take on the story and, and more fully tell the story of African-Americans and moonshine because it is they were a key group, particularly in the eastern part of the state um, in terms of, of uh, the people actually making hauling and doing the, 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 the heavy work in making moonshine uh, in this state. And uh, that's, a, that's an untold story uh, that, that really needs to be, um, you know, I think I started off and hopefully pointed some people in a direction. Um, and so moonshine is very much uh, deeply enmeshed in the culture of uh, African-Americans in North Carolina. Now, one of the interesting things is that the way Moonshine worked with African-Americans was more like a, the uh, sharecropping system. And so the still itself was often owned by uh, a white person of means who provided the still, the, uh, the ingredients, uh, those types of things. And then the uh, African-Americans just, uh, you know, um, did, the, did the work, uh, the distribution, uh, uh, the manufacturing, and incurred all the risk and got little in, in, in terms of the profit. So it's, so it's an old story, but it's, uh, but it's a very important story in this state, the role of African-Americans. Another group that was important in moonshine in North Carolina were Native Americans. Uh, most folks don't realize that North Carolina has more Native Americans in it than any state uh, east of Oklahoma. And um, the picture there is kind of a romanticized picture is of a woman uh, from um, Robinson County uh, by the name of Rutter Lowry. Uh, and she was the wife of William Henry Lowry, who was the famous, you could call him a freedom fighter or you could call him an outlaw. Uh, uh, I'll let you decide uh, how you would characterize him, but who, who died uh, in the, uh, uh, and, or somebody say he disappeared, they didn't really die, it's kind of like Elvis, uh, but uh, left Rhoda a widow. And Rhoda did what a lot of women did in North Carolina who were widowed or divorced or were abandoned by their husband. And she started selling illegal liquor out of the back of her house. And uh, she was busted for that uh, in the 1880s and went to, went to jail for a short period of time uh, but they let her out pretty quickly. But uh, I, I speak of Rhoda because of this connection, particularly of the Lumbee, uh, who had a long tradition of, of making liquor. Uh, now, one of the interesting things about African-Americans and Native Americans in North Carolina is that they are re really the original moonshiners in this state. And they are the original ones because they were making liquor illegally from the 1830s on, while, while white, uh, there was a state law that was passed in the 1830s, which forbade uh, free persons of color from manufacturing liquor. Now that did not stop African-Americans and Native Americans from making liquor. And so they were making it illegal, uh, you know, long 30 years before, um, uh, before white North Carolinians were making illegal liquor. Uh, and, then, and then finally, one of the fascinating things that I found was the role of women uh, in the moonshine business. Um, it's it, on, on a number of different levels. You, know, you see women uh, who, are, who, who are wives and daughters who are acting as lookouts, who are helping out as stills. Uh, in some cases, uh, there's one great story that the writer John Paris, uh, a newspaper man in Western North Carolina, who did a kind of local color uh, stories uh, wrote about a woman whose husband, uh, whose father got sick he, and he was the chief source of income in the family. And so she took over the, the family moonshine business and became very successful at it. Although she didn't drink a drop of it herself, she said, and, uh, uh, and she was a teetotaler, but, uh, but um, women moonshiners were incredibly important and particularly uh, about the, um, the, the late 19th and early 20th century, well before you had any sort of a, of a social safety network uh, in this state. And Moonshine in many ways was, was a social safety network for women who did not have male providers. And you see this commonly across the state, you see it across the races uh, where women, again, who are widowed, divorced, 
uh, abandoned by their husband, uh, who have husbands who are handicapped uh, in some way. Uh, it was an acceptable thing, in, in particularly in rural areas, but, but also in urban areas as well, particularly in poor neighborhoods, for women under these circumstances to uh, either sell or manufacture moonshine. And so, um, and there's some, uh, you know, I would invite you, one of the fun things I did in the book or that UNC Press let me do would do a Moonshine Hall of Fame. And uh, some of the women that are in the Moonshine Hall of Fame are just incredible stories. I don't really have time to get into them, but, but would invite you to, to um, look into the lives of, of, of women like Betty Sims out of Polk County, who was just an incredible story. So, but again, uh, it's all over the state and it's in uh, every racial and ethnic group in the state uh, and, uh, and men and women uh, across the board involved in this. <coughs> um, now, this is an interesting thing, you know, where you can say, and I can do this in really any area of the state because every area of the state um, was uh, a hotbed, but uh, in, the, in the Wake County, Raleigh area, um, there were really some, um, a, a lot of moonshine activity. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll speak of this gentleman who some of you may recognize uh, in just a minute, but, uh, but Chatham County uh, for one was, um, was uh, a, one of the top moonshine counties in the state. Uh, in the latter part of the 19th and early years of the 20th century. Um, uh, Durham County, particularly Northern Durham County, uh, had a long history, Orange County and Wake County itself. Uh, but probably the county in uh, your area of the state uh, that was most known for its moonshine uh, and still has that reputation in some ways is Johnson, uh, Johnson County. And the individual there in the hat is one of the more uh, famous, uh, notorious, uh, however you describe it, North Carolina moonshiners. An individual by the name of Percy Flowers. And Mr. Percy, as he was known uh, in Johnson County, uh, owned this store uh, not too far from Clayton out in the country at a country crossroads. And that was the center of his enterprise there. Uh, and Percy was a major moonshiner from the 1920s uh, into the 1970s when he died. Um, uh, the African-American individual in the previous slide, um, uh, Howard Creech worked for Percy Flowers. He's kind of Percy Flowers' right-hand man. And he, he uh, uh, Percy ran his moonshine enterprises very much like a sharecropping operation. But in the 1950s, uh, the um, Saturday Evening Post uh, did a profile of Percy Flowers, uh, a, a major profile in a national magazine. And uh, their, their contention in that article was that Percy Flowers was making over a million dollars a year. And uh, uh, he owned thousands of acres in uh, Johnson County, which is now owned by his daughter who has a major real estate empire <clears throat> in that county. Uh, but Percy Flowers, uh, probably the thing that he is best known for is the fact that, that uh, it, you know, everybody knew Percy Flowers was this major moonshiner, but they can never convict him of anything. They tried him on tax evasion. They, they um, you know, they, they seized all kinds of stills and moonshine uh, arrested people that worked for him, but they could never make anything stick, um, uh, stick with him. And uh, he did uh, have one conviction and that was for contempt of court when he threatened an African-American federal agent who testified against him uh, in a trial and uh, uh, in, in, in front of reporters and uh, a number of individuals in front of the, I think, Wake County Courthouse. And uh, he was, um, uh, served a little less than a year, I believe, at that point. But, uh, but again, all around the uh, Wake County, Raleigh area, moonshine was particularly important. Um, one thing I might add about uh, your area is that probably 
some of the best customers of moonshiners in the state uh, resided at least for part of the year uh, in, um, uh, in Raleigh uh, and inhabited the state legislature. So that was a great market for moonshine for much of North Carolina history. Um, all right, so uh, an, another thing that I had a lot of fun with in the book was the issue of religion and moonshine because that's, that's uh, uh, something that uh, there's a lot of misconception there. Now, uh, you know, I have to say I grew up Baptist uh, in Asheville. Uh, my dad was a Southern Baptist minister. Uh, my parents, uh, he, he, he passed away about 20 years ago. Um, but he and my mom were about the uh, most teetotaling people you can imagine. And so I grew up in that environment, very steeped in uh, Southern Baptist life. Uh, remember well as a child in church, we would do something, if uh, any of you are Baptist, you probably remember this. We would do something when we did communion, we would do a responsive reading of something called the church covenant. And in that church covenant, <clears throat> there was a line that said that you were pledging to abstain from the sale and use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage. And, um, and so, uh, you know, that was part of Baptist liturgy, I guess, if, if, if you can say Baptists have a litur liturgy. Uh, but I learned very quickly, you know, as a young boy, that uh, there were people who either weren't saying those words or were mouthing the words, uh, or they may have been saying them, but they weren't exactly practicing them. And uh, there, uh, there's plenty, and there's also a, a, a real divide among Baptists. Um, and I'll, these are all Baptists, <laughs> staunch Baptists uh, in many ways. Uh, Percy Flowers, uh, uh, Popcorn Sutton, and, and uh, 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 Jim Tom, uh, oh gosh, what's Jim Tom's last name? I'll think of it, but he's a, one of the stars of the Moonshiner show. Uh, these are all Baptists. Um, uh, in fact, I'll tell a story on Popcorn, uh, a photographer who also did a biography of, of Popcorn, uh, called him up one time and said, Popcorn, I need to do, um, uh, take some more photos of, of you. You know, can I come over uh, Sunday morning and do that? And Popcorn's response was, Hell no, God damn it! It's Sunday. I'll be in church, uh, and so um, you see this a lot uh, with uh, you know with these these moonshiners, particularly in rural areas. Uh, churches in many cases wouldn't exist. Popcorn's uh, grandfather um, built the first Baptist church on uh, in the Hemp Hill area of Maggie Valley with the proceeds of a run of moonshine. You know, a lot of ministers wouldn't be paid. Um, Church wouldn't be painted, churches wouldn't be built. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, the churches wouldn't run without the proceeds of, of uh, moonshine. And, uh, and, and there was also a turnaround there. Uh, Percy Flowers, <clears throat> whenever Percy uh, was hauled into court, he could always uh, count on the pastor of the White Oak Baptist Church, which was uh, his, his wife was a Sunday school teacher there, uh, uh, coming to testify to Mr. Percy's stellar character. Uh, and so it, it, you see a real divide. You know, a lot of the, the uh, temperance stuff and anti-moonshine stuff comes out of town and city Baptist churches. Um, but in rural areas, it was, uh, there was a pretty much an understanding in a lot of these rural Baptist churches and Methodists and, you know, whatever else, uh, Pentecostal in particular, that, um, that this was something that a lot of people needed to do in order to feed, house, put shoes on the feet of their children. Uh, and so, um, you know, again, it's, um, there's a, a, a really strange thing, you know, about how Baptists are so staunchly uh, prohibition uh, oriented and, you know, held the line in North Carolina for so long. The other thing that you see in so many towns was that uh, whenever there was a referendum, and of course, when when national prohibition ends, uh, North Carolina goes back to an earlier system where, you know, it's local choice, local option as to whether they would, and then they created the ABC system, you know, so whether you'd have an ABC store or sell beer in the stores or wine or whatever. <clears throat> and um, 
whenever you'd have one of those elections, you would have, you could guarantee that the Baptists and the moonshiners were going to unite to fight that uh, referendum tooth and nail and keep liquor out. Uh, there was a, 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 I came across a really interesting uh, story in, I think, the Charlotte Observer, which was talking about uh, a campaign in Wilkes County to bring in an ABC store. And uh, uh, I think it was one of the TV stations in Charlotte uh, went up there to do a story on it. They interviewed this guy, you know, who was staunchly against it and said over and over about how it's going to ruin the community if they had an ABC story uh, uh, on and on. And what turns out this guy was the biggest bootlegger in the county. And uh, that's a common thing. Um, another really fun thing I did with this book, I, you know, I, my wife, um, you know, when people ask about my work, my wife just kind of rolls her eyes um, because I do research on moonshine and stock car racing and national parks and, you know, have to do all kinds of uh, uh, stuff, um, you know, hike and uh, hang out with moonshiners and uh, uh, go to stock car races and things like that, uh, you know, and call it work. But um, one, one of the things that was fun to do was to um, write about the Andy Griffith show and, 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 and what Andy Griffith knew and how he depicted that as part of the, uh, of, of how North Carolina uh, culture was so steep in, uh, in moonshine. This is a famous picture of uh, Andy Griffith give, doing his, what it was, was football at halftime of the NC State um, uh, UNC uh, football game. But one of the things that was fun, and I, and I have, and I've heard anecdotally that John Grisham does the same thing. So I'll put myself in his company. But a lot of my writing I do um, on the bar in uh, between my kitchen and, and den. And a, a lot of times I would turn on while I was writing, I just kind of have a TV playing in the background on TV land. And in the mornings, that means the Andy Griffith show. And so it was always kind of there. And so, um, you know, an important part of it. In fact, one morning I was watching the show or, or working away and, and I was thinking I was in the final stage of the book and thinking about a dedication. And uh, uh, I, at first I thought, well, I just won't, I, I done one to my wife, my parents, you know, friends, my kids, uh, my mentors. And so I thought I just won't do one. And then it dawned on me all of a sudden that I ought to dedicate this book to Andy Griffith. And so that's one of the things I'm really proud of. I thought that turned out well, but Andy Griffith really captured a lot of things about moonshining. Uh, and of course he's from Surrey County and, um, you know, grew up in an environment where there were lots of moonshiners and lots of moonshiner stories uh, around. And uh, some of the things that Andy Griffith does, of course, they're always played for laughs, uh, but he is one of the few cases in popular culture that shows women moonshiners that, um, uh, I can't, Clarabelle, and I can't remember their names right, right, right off the bat, but uh, uh, these women moonshiners who had uh, what Opie called a flower making machine in their greenhouse uh, and were supplying the county with moonshine. Uh, but other cases, where the relationships that Andy had with moonshiners uh, were in many ways accurate for local sheriffs. Um, one of the interesting things about enforcement is that the federal agents were guaranteed, pretty much guaranteed in force, although, although they could be corrupted. Local sheriffs had to run for re-election. They were related to moonshiners. And so they were uh, tended to take a softer line or, or uh, look away from moonshine. Now, Andy was pretty zealous about enforcing it, but when he caught people, uh, you know, and they had to go hard, they, their crops were coming in. He'd let them out to go uh, harvest their crops or he, he would let them go for Christmas or try to at least, someone was always trying to thwart that. Uh, you know, and I think most importantly, he showed moonshiners not as, as uh, violent, ignorant uh, hillbillies, but as, uh, as human beings. And that's one of the important things that I tried to do. So I appreciate very much um, Andy Griffith's depiction of the moonshiner in North Carolina, uh, because in so many ways he was, you know, he was very accurate in that depiction. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, finish up with, and again, there's so much in the book that I hadn't really been able to, to, uh, uh, to touch on, but uh, um, some of you are familiar with Popcorn Sutton. 
and uh, popcorn. Uh, again, he kind of split his time between um, uh, Maggie Valley, North Carolina and Cock County, Tennessee, kind of floated back and forth across the state line, which is not an uncommon thing. You know, a lot of moonshiners located stills near the state line so they could slip across uh, whenever it got too hot and popcorn kept operations in both states. He became quite famous um, for uh, this documentary, The Last One, uh, but also the Moonshiner show. Uh, there were, uh, he was on the Jackass show. I mean, a lot of, he became quite well known in the early 2000s uh, until he uh, kind of became a victim of his own notoriety. He, he, he made one of these statements about, uh, you know, they'll never put me back in jail and that type of thing and I'll never go. And then he got caught. Uh, but right before he was supposed to report to federal penitentiary, he, he got in his uh, uh, a five gallon Ford fail, uh, Fairlane, as he called it, uh, which was a car that he, he bought with five gallons of, uh, of, of his liquor and uh, uh, ran a, <coughs> um, a hose pipe uh, into the compartment and committed suicide. Uh, but, you know, which in some ways increased his fame. He had a big funeral there in, in uh, Cock County. Hank Williams Jr. came out. Uh, and now there's a legal brand of, um, of uh, moonshine, uh, of, of popcorn moonshine. Uh, and so in many ways, popcorn was responsible for a revival in the moonshine business. And there are a number of reasons why uh, moonshine had a huge comeback <laughs> in the um, uh, in the 2000s that continues to this day. Um, one was the fact that uh, there was a lot of nostalgia about it. And uh, with the internet, uh, people were able to find recipes, to purchase stills and other uh, equipment off the internet. Uh, I don't know how many people I know uh, who have bought them a still and tried to make liquor, you know, most of it to relatively disastrous results. Uh, you know, undrinkable uh, results, but um, but it's something that uh, you know that has become increasingly common. And 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 then those people who had those skills, like Popcorn Sutton, who was a longtime moonshiner, you know, it was tremendously helpful to uh, to their business. In fact, um, I talked to a guy, you know, I don't know, a year or so ago, up in Jackson County, and he was I, I was shocked you know he just admitted to the fact that he was selling you know maybe 70 gallons of liquor a week and so it's still very much out there uh people always you know when i give talks and stuff they're always saying well i know where you can get some i said well i do too <laughs> you know uh, because there are a lot of people making it a lot of, you know most of it is uh you know pretty small scale but you still have a number of sizable operations that are uh that are out there you know and so there are certain communities that uh, really like it and 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 there is this thing uh, this kind of nostalgia uh, about moonshine and people, uh, uh, you know, want to taste it. You know, I, I do always say uh, to people is that it's important to know who, uh, who made the moonshine. Uh, and um, uh, there was a real problem. One of the things that led to the decline of moonshine was in 1960, there was a, uh, there was a major in the fifties and then in the 60s, particularly in the Triad area, uh, Piedmont Triad area, uh, where a number of people uh, got seriously sick and a number died because of the use of stills that uh, uh, using galvanized um, uh, metal and uh, that leached uh, lead acetate into the moonshine. And so, um, so you don't really know what's in it. Uh, so it's important, I, I would recommend knowing. Now, the other thing that led to this boom was in moonshine was the quote legal moonshine now there there are you know a lot of people that say well if it's legal it ain't moonshine uh because uh, uh, moonshine of course you know you make it under the light of the moon so you don't get caught uh but there has been a boom since uh changes came in um in the laws in north carolina that allowed for uh, small distillers. And so they have proliferated across the state. I, the last chapter I write about these <laughs> uh, folks, but I just couldn't keep up. You know, ma the, mat uh, the material, you know, the book's been out a year 
uh, but that chapter is dated because there are so many more legal distillers in North Carolina now. But um, the, the oldest one was Piedmont Distillers, which was a, uh, an executive from uh, R.J. Reynolds, uh, who uh, opened a, uh, a distillery up in Madison, just north of, um, uh, Winston, of the Winston-Salem Greensboro uh, area. Uh, and then he partnered with Junior Johnson to make um, Junior Johnson's Midnight Moon as their best-selling uh, a product, but others came along uh, on the, uh, the woman there, uh, Troy Ball in Asheville, who was from Texas originally, moved into the Leicester section of Buncombe County and met some moonshiners there. And she learned about something that uh, they called uh, keeper, uh, uh, keeper liquor. Um, a lot of the illegal liquor, there is a lot of nostalgia about it, but most of it was pretty horrible stuff. It was made really distilled sugar. Uh, for the most part was pretty ho horrible. But a lot of these uh, moonshiners would make uh, what they call keeper liquor that they kept for themselves and their family and friends. And she discovered this and thought this stuff's pretty good and, it, and it's a great mixer for cocktails. So, um, so she created Troy and Sons, which is a really nice operation uh, in Asheville. And then I, <clears throat> I have to give my uh, former student, Cody Bradford, uh, a a plug, uh, Hallie Moon Distillery. Uh, Cody was a student of mine at UNC Asheville, a history major. And um, uh, he had a long tradition of, of moonshine in his family up in uh, Burnsville area, Yancey County. And um, uh, in fact, he, on one of his stills, he has a condenser that he found in a barn that, that belonged to his great grandfather. So, um, so I always recommend, you know, I. I have to honor my mother and I would not recommend that anyone drink it, but if you're bound and determined to do so, I, I do recommend the Halley Moon variety. Although there, there are so many varieties now and most of the ones that are making it are making it more in an old style way using corn. Uh, so moonshine is still very much alive and well uh, in North Carolina. And, uh, and I think it's gonna be with us uh, for uh, uh, for a while still, so um, you know again, I you know I think uh, you know it's time for the state to uh, uh, to recognize uh, uh, you know one of its top industries and uh, uh, acknowledge North Carolina's role as the uh, as the moonshine capital of the world. Um, so either a license tag or um, uh, you know, some sort of uh, state illegal beverage or something like that would be appropriate. So thank you so much uh, uh, for coming out tonight. It, this, is a, this is a time I think when we probably all need a little moonshine. And so hopefully you enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the talk tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Pierce. We have quite a few questions for you. <laughs> no okay. surprise there. Um, the first one is a bit long, so hang with me. It says, uh, when I was a medical student at Duke in 1967, uh, during clinical rotation, I cared for a veteran with terrible uh, bone marrow problems. Um, he admitted to being a moonshiner and described to me how he added the contents of truck battery to his batch to give it an extra kick. Um, he did not do well. In later years, grateful patients would occasionally give me a gift of homemade liquor. Remembering the veteran, I never consumed it. Have you ever reviewed death certificates related to moonshine? Yeah, no, I, I, I hadn't reviewed death certificates, but, um, you know, I do write uh, about, particularly in the 1960s, uh, and, and, and this was a problem all along, you know, particularly um, as moonshine became more and more profitable and people were um, selling moonshine. I mean, I mean, you have longer lines of distribution, so you don't really know who's making it. And, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, adulteration of moonshine was pretty common uh, because the primary goal, I mean, was not taste and, you know, sipping whiskey and stuff like that. It was, you know, get drunk quick. And, um, and so people, um, what you wanted to do as a, as, a, as a distiller was to keep the proof as low as possible so that you, ex you know, you could make more, you know, extended your moonshine but make it appear to be high proof. 
And so they would add all kinds of things. They would add lye. Um, some people said they would put uh, chicken manure, uh, you know, uh, you know, all kinds of things, Buckeyes, uh, all kinds of things. And then the equipment that they're distilling with, uh, you know, people would, you know, particularly when copper got expensive, copper's ideal for this, but they're running uh, using uh, uh, car radiators as, um, as condensers. Uh, and so, you know, and things like this, and then later using galvanized steel, you know, which is leasing, uh, leaching lead acetate into, um, uh, into the uh, liquor. And so it's a real problem. Uh, and again, you, you see periodically, uh, most notably in the 1960s where you have um, deaths. And, you know, I think uh, probably a lot of death certificates would not have identified uh, alcohol as a problem uh, or illegal alcohol as a problem. I mean, um, you know, they may have identi identified alcoholism as a problem and liver problems uh, as a cause of death, but uh, they probably wouldn't have noted the cumulative effect, particularly of lead acetate. Uh, that people are ingesting because that accumulates over time, stays in the body, and uh, has long-term uh, horrible effects on people. So, you know, we do romanticize it, and um, you know, but it is important to also say there there are real costs uh, to this. You know, that were not good for for the state or for individuals in the state. Um, are there currently many small moonshine operations or have they been taken over by bigger concerns such as Mr. Percy's? Such as what? Mr. Percy's. Oh, um, you did see uh, after World War II, and well, with national prohibition, uh, but particularly after World War II, uh, a lot of consolidation. Uh, and um, where you would have more um, you know, individuals who are bankrolling uh, operations and have numerous sites, you know, scattered um, throughout uh, an area or, or even statewide. Um, and, um, and you saw that, but, you know, even then you, you have plenty of small operators, but again, you do see that change, uh, particularly in the, um, in the forties and fifties, um, and uh, uh, and into the 60s, where you have people like Percy Flowers who have major operations. The Burgess brothers in Catawba County had a huge operation going on uh, that was very much plugged into the early days of NASCAR as well. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, so you saw a lot of consolidation at that point. And then, you know, those that were left making it in the 70s, a lot of these people went into marijuana, uh, you know, selling marijuana if they stayed on the illegal side, um, but they were small operations. And that's, that's what generally continues today. You occasionally find a big operation, but for the most part, the profit's not there. <laughs> uh, any idea who first labeled it moonshine? Yeah, that goes back to the to the British Isles, to Scotland, uh, uh, I believe, and so it's something that that traveled across the ocean. Um, you know, when the British put an excise tax on um, on liquor uh, in the British Isles, uh, and then people went underground, you know, and made it in the light of the moon. Uh, to, to, so that's where that comes from. It's interesting, you know. One of the fun things uh, I also was able to do would do some stuff on on the various names. Of, uh, of illegal liquor. And so the original name, the most common name in the uh, latter part of the 19th century was blockade uh, and moonshiners were blockaders, uh, you know, which referred to the notion of, um, you know, that they are running a blockade basically to deliver their product to, uh, to, uh, to market a blockade of, of federal agents. And so blockade was the most common term of course, white lightning is a term. There are also some really interesting uh, uh, ones that have come along. One of my favorites is Southpaw, uh, which is a real common name around the turn of the century. And it was based on a patent medicine uh, that was out there called Southpaw, and uh, you know, which was um, you know, a high concentration of, uh, of alcohol. Uh, and then my favorite from the Western, and this is, I've only found in the Western part of the state, 
but my favorite one, I think from about the 1950s is called pertinent juice. And so I'm, that's one of my favorites, but, uh, but again, most commonly, you know, moonshine is, uh, 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 Mountain Dew, you know, another one, you know, very famous, um, yeah, again, you know, one of the things, great contribution in North Carolina, Baskin Lamar Lunsford and, uh, you know, collected that song, uh, Good Old Mountain Dew. Uh, so lots of names, but again, moonshine being the most common that comes from the British Isles. Who do you think are the top three moonshiners of all time? <laughs> well, you know, probably the top three moonshiners in the world are all from North Carolina. So, you know, that'd be hard to say. Percy Flowers, you have to put up there. Um, you know, I have, uh, you know, again, one of the fun things with that Moonshine Hall of Fame that uh, I was able to do. But Percy Flowers is up there. Junior Johnson, you have to put up there just because of, you know, how famous and successful he was. And I think Junior also represents something really important about our notion of kind of the ignorant, um, uneducated, uh, lazy moonshiner. Um, I, I got to spend a fair amount of time with Junior Johnson over the years, and uh, he's one of the smartest individuals I've ever known. And uh, I've long said about Junior Johnson that he may have never read a physics book, but I think he could write one. So Junior's uh, up there. <laughs> and of course, his family was, you know, long-term moonshiners in Wilkes County. Uh, and probably another one, um, oh gosh, uh, uh, oh, Lewis, uh, oh, what's his first name? Anyway, the king of the moonshiners, um, I'll think of his first name in a minute, but, um, Lu uh, excuse me, Lewis Redman, who was from Transylvania County, and uh, he became, in the 1880s, uh, he became incredibly famous. He was written up in the New York Times. Uh, he was... Um, 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 highlighted in, you know, major articles. He was, uh, 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 Wade Hampton, the governor of South Carolina was one of his major fans and patrons. Uh, and, uh, you know, people followed his exploits. There were two dime novels written about him, uh, that sold hundreds of thousands of copies across the nation were translated into, uh, uh, German and uh, other land distributed around the world and, uh, you know, very famous. Um, ended up, you know, uh, he actually spent a lot of his time in the upstate of South Carolina. But he was from North Carolina and then he, when it got too hot in South Carolina, he went into the uh, Swain County area around Bryson City, which is where he was finally caught. He was sent to the, to the uh, federal penitentiary in Albany, New York, which was a lot of North Carolina, uh, Linians spent time there. Uh, and then he uh, was pardoned by Chester Arthur, uh, partly because of Wade Hampton and others. Zeb Vance was a big uh, uh, supporter of Moonshiners as well. Uh, and then, I, uh, you know, Amos Owens from Rutherford County, uh, the Cherry Bounce King. Uh, again, there, I mean, you can just go on and on and on with, uh, um, you know, there's so many people that were, you know, nationally famous in some way. Um, you know, that were moonshiners from North Carolina. So to wrap up with our last question, kind of looking towards the future of um, moonshining in the state, are there any efforts to make personal batches legal like beer and wine? Uh, um, yeah, that's an interesting thing. And most people don't realize that, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, they think it's like beer and wine that, that I can make from my personal consumption uh, 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 so much. Um, and you can't, uh, you can't make any uh, legally. Um, now, um, I haven't heard of any movements to do that. For one, the federal government is incredibly protective of revenue from liquor. Uh, and it has always produced a lot of revenue for the federal government. And they're very protective of that money. And, uh, uh, and so I don't foresee uh, uh, that um, and, uh, you know, but at the same time, you know, it's not like the uh, uh, federal revenue agents or either local law enforcement are going to come around and try and shut down your stove stop, stove top still. Now, I'm not telling you go out and make it yourself, but it's unlikely. Now, it has happened. You know, there was a, a, a guy in Wills County. Uh, who uh, from the Combs family, which is a long time notorious moonshine family in, in Wilkes County, 
uh, who had a pretty good size still. He said he was just giving it away and he wasn't selling it or anything, but he had hit a nice still. He was, he was curious about his family tradition and, uh, uh, and he gave some to the wrong person, I guess. And so they came in and did uh, arrest him and, and the still was so well built, they couldn't figure out how to destroy it. So they, uh, they actually, he personally uh, put a chain around it got his tractor and hauled it out into a field and they blew it up. But, <laughs> but, oh, wow. uh, but, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that was an exceptional case right there. Cause he was making a good bit, uh, a good bit of it. But, um, uh, uh, I don't anticipate that changing, but again, at the same time, I don't anticipate a major crackdown, uh, by the, uh, by either local, uh, state or federal, um, uh, liquor enforcement folks uh, for people making it on their stovetops or in their basement or something like that. But it's not legal. I will tell you that it is not legal. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pierce, for such an awesome talk. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure that a lot of our uh, attendees do as well. So many personal stories in the chat about uh, Mr. Percy and interactions with him and his family and um, a lot of folks came into contact with him apparently and he made no impression. <laughs> so <laughs> um, thank you guys for joining us this evening. Um, we hope to see you at our next program on Thursday, November 19th at 7 p.m. entitled History and Highballs Air Mount. Uh, we're gonna have Grant uh, Critimus, uh, curator and director of collections for Classical American Homes Preservation Trust. So we hope to see you then. Uh, in the meantime, everyone take care, stay well, and we will see you soon. Have a good evening.